those of you who haven't met, I'm Vaughn Welch. I'm the director of CACR, and welcome to the kickoff of the 2019-2020 CACR Speaker Series. And I'll get to introducing our guest today in just a second. Uh, first, let me thank Diana and Tori who are out in the hall and Leslie for all the logistics and everything that go into that. So there's Diana trying to sneak out. So everyone, please uh, join me in thanking them. So we're really excited uh, about our speaker series this year. We've got a, a great lineup uh, from across the country of legal and technical folks with different perspectives on cybersecurity. Do mark your calendar on January 30th. Uh, Bruce Schneier, who many of you may know, is a very well-known commenter, uh, commentator on cybersecurity, will be our, our guest that day. It'll be at a special time and place. Uh, that's going to be in Wittinger Auditorium, so we'll let you know uh, about that when it gets closer, but please just keep that one on your radar. So turning today, we've got a special speaker uh, joining us today to kick off this. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome Andrew Cordy, who is the Chief Information Security Officer here at Indiana University. So IU's security office is responsible for standards administration, technical risk programs, security reviews, consulting technical security resources, and technical responses to security incidents for all of the IU campuses uh, across the state. And Andrew comes to us via uh, Purdue University where he's got a degree in physics. So with that, He's going to talk to us today about uh, swift, swift and reasonable action. And with that, please uh, join me in welcoming Andrew. Thanks, Bob. Uh, raise your hand in the back if you can hear me. Is that loud enough? Okay. Good. Remote? Okay. Yeah, great. Good. All right. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. I'm going to try and give you the perspective of a higher ed CISO as well as some insight into our operations here at IU. And I'm going to start with a metaphor. So in Germany, they have these brilliantly designed treetop walks. And they start at ground level, so they're accessible to everybody. And they end up being quite high up in the trees. Uh, in, the, in the picture here, we're quite far off the ground, even though the trees are towering way above us. Uh, now, I'm afraid of heights, so when I was on one of these with my family, I was at all times either hewing to the exact center of the, the boardwalk or sort of like just clinging to the side railing. Um, and as you can see, in contrast, my, uh, my daughters are, are totally fine with the situation, um, but in, in typical security guy fashion, I was thinking the whole time we were on this, I was thinking of all of the additional safeguards that, that might have reduced the risk of being on one of these walks. And could imagine myself as like a safety expert in a meeting when these were being designed and uh, arguing that, that these additional controls be implemented. But I would be wrong uh, because there is a reasonable level of safeguards in this application and the Germans have found it perfectly. Does reasonable mean convenient for everyone? No. Uh, some photographers might be upset that these struts are in the way of their shot, uh, but this inconvenience is acceptable given the security afforded. And while striking this balance, the designers never forgot the reason for doing the project in the first place. Can you imagine if a safety expert had pounded on the table in that design meeting, insisting on solid six-foot walls on either side. Not only would the treetop walk be uh, much less enjoyable and useful, but there would have been unintended consequences, like people trying to climb the walls to get at the view. And when I started in information security, I didn't have the reasonableness doctrine down yet. Uh, I wanted every control turned on. But eventually, I learned to keep the organization's vision in mind when designing safeguards. If nothing else, it helps 
when trying to sell those safeguards to other leaders in the organization. Now, my metaphor isn't fully apt here because it only illustrates protective safeguards and says nothing about response to a threat or an attack. And today, a swift response is more important than ever. In fact, most people underestimate the threats that we're facing today, or they assume that their employer or their bank or their government, et cetera, is protecting them. And to some extent, that's true, but there's still plenty of residual risk. And when faced with these threats, we really can't hesitate. We have to act swiftly. So can anyone guess what our top three information security threats are at IU? Honor on. Fishing. Fishing, yeah. Any others? People. Fishing, people. I'm careful about saying, people say that people are the weakest link in security. I don't like saying that because it's kind of like going to a basketball game and saying the, 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 the worst, like the, the weakest link is, is the players, <laughs> right? The, the people are part of the situation. So um, I like to think of them as the last line of defense. But anyway, the, the three, um, the three fastest growing and the three top sources of security incidents are uh, phishing on a rock's right, human mistakes, which I'll give to Emily on that one, um, and credential reuse. Um, so for phishing, we're on track to sub sustain upwards of 18,000 phishing attacks this calendar year. And I'll talk about how we defend against those attacks later in the presentation. These attacks are also increasing in sophistication, such that it's difficult for a user to tell the difference between a legit email message and a phish. Once an attacker has stolen the credentials from phishing, they try to reuse them on other sites. Uh, for example, they try to use your Facebook password on your Gmail account. And we see an increasing number of attacks trying to reuse credentials against IU as well from other breaches that happen around the internet. So this is why it's important to have different passwords on your various accounts here and throughout the internet. I personally place more of a focus on that than on having a strong pass, password or password. That's important, but it's even more important to have different unique passwords on different services. And then human mistakes like sending an email full of sensitive information to the wrong person or taking home a binder full of uh, information in an unsecured car, these things continue to be sources of uh, compromise. And while I do think training is important to, uh, to, to reduce these incidents, I contend that many of these mistakes stem from usability gaps in our interfaces to computers and, and data. So given these threats, what are we doing about them? I'm not going to give a comprehensive list, but I will describe several of our most interesting initiatives. And we start with uh, a strong team. So we have six security engineers at IU focused on new measures to improve security protections at IU, as well as advanced incident response when needed. Our analyst team uh, performs security reviews of new services, uh, products, cloud services, and uh, other supply chain protection mechanisms. Uh, extended staff are fairly new. These are staff in departments that work as part of our team, and I'll explain more on that later. Uh, and then brand new are our Security Operations Center staff that will take the advanced incident response work off of the engineers so that they can focus more on long-term pro uh, proactive measures. By the way, we're hiring for these positions, uh, and I will collect resumes at the end of the talk if you have one to, to hand me. Uh, this isn't the full extent of personnel doing information security at, at IU. We work very closely with our policy office, which handles the bulk of the day-to-day -day incident response work, among many other things. Also, uh, there are IT units that perform uh, many security operations duties, like uh, identity management and maintaining firewalls and, and things like that. Now, 
Now, even with a robust team, uh, CISOs also have to collaborate with their counterparts at other organizations, even competing organizations. So the financial industry, for example, they've decided that they're not going to compete on security. That's a big deal. Can you imagine the financial industry saying, mm, we're not going to try to have a competitive advantage in this one area? That was a surprise to me. But in information security, they've decided that's not the way to go. So they're working together. They're sharing intelligence. They're sharing techniques. They're evaluating each other, uh, doing reviews and penetration tests of each other. These practices all enable swift and reasonable action. And why would we behave any differently in higher ed? We're a sector that's renowned for its collaboration uh, and cooperation. This is the Big Ten Center in Chicago. I meet face-to-face -face three times a year with the CISOs of other Big Ten institutions. Also, uh, our security staff at IU have regular communication with security practitioners at over 600 other universities uh, through the REN ISAC, uh, which is the Research and Education Networking Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Quite an awful, but what the organization does is pretty straightforward. They facilitate information sharing uh, across security teams at higher education and research institutions throughout the U.S. Uh, and in many other countries as well. Mm -hmm. One of the fruits of our collaboration with other Big Ten schools has been the OmniSOC. I would say swift and reasonable action is about reducing the time between the first awareness of a threat and the mitigation of that threat. So this is a very key piece. Once we know something's happening, we need to act swiftly. And in the past, those two events haven't always been that close together. We find out about something, but because of technical issues or political issues, it takes a while to mitigate the threat, either to block the system or uh, scramble the account passphrase that's compromised or whatever. So getting those events closer together is a really key piece. And the OmniSOC is one of uh, our many efforts focused on that goal right now. A SOC, by the way, is a security operations center. Uh, that can mean different things to different people, but in this case, it's a team of people managing systems that detect malicious behavior on networks and they're able to analyze that data and act on it in some way. The OmniSOC is, is unique as far as SOCs go in that it was established by five Big Ten institutions. It's hosted here at IU, and well, when a threat is detected at any one institution, alerts are relayed to all the members who can then take action. So, Let's say something malicious is detected at Northwestern, somebody trying to brute force accounts. Uh, our team at IU will be alerted and can take action here before that attack makes its way here, uh, preferably before, right? And so that's swift action, right? And uh, the other um, customer institutions aren't the only source of intel. So I, I mentioned Northwestern, but uh, there may be other feeds, uh, commercial feeds, for example. Um, the emerging threats feed comes to mind. Um, any, anything that the OmniSoc deems trustworthy, they can they can funnel in and and do analysis on this data. Um, some automated, uh, some manually performed analysis. Uh, they have a highly skilled team there, and uh, they determine what. Uh, notifications to make and what, what actions to take. Um, something is wrong with Zoom, maybe? Everything's still okay remotely? Okay, I'm just, I have a spinning wheel here, so hopefully I can just ignore that. Oh. Did you lose my slides? Wi-Fi. You have a Wi Fi issue. Yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me let me tether.
<clears throat> yeah, I wanted to uh, I wanted to connect to the wired Ethernet, but um, I didn't have the right connector. Personal hotspots. Let's hope it works. You're back. Uh, well, it was. <laughs> and then it was. <laughs> Can you see the slides in Indy? Cool. Good. All right. Where was I? So the Amisoc has been successful. Uh, in fiscal year 2019, uh, IU received over 100 alerts from the Omnisoc, uh, most of which were legitimate incidents. Um, these incidents might have gone on much longer undetected and done more damage uh, had we not had the Omnisoc to alert us. In the future, we hope to feed more potential threat data to the Omnisoc and rely on it increasingly for our detection and, and response. <laughs> Any questions about the Omnisoc? <laughs> Now, uh, that's not to say that all security can operate behind the scenes the way uh, a SOC does. Everyone at IU is well aware uh, that we've implemented two-factor authentication, uh, which we call two-step login, for just about every service. Um, and at IU, we use Duo security. There are other products out there as well. Um, Duo is an inconvenience for some people, uh, but for now, it has made phishing almost completely ineffective against IU. Um, and that's what makes it reasonable, right? It's, that's what makes the inconvenience worthwhile. Even if the phishing uh, itself works uh, and the attacker steals a user's password, it's unlikely the attacker can also fake the two-factor. Not exactly true, uh, because criminals have made advancements in this area. Uh, they've managed to trick users into approving fake two-factor requests. Um, one of their approaches is just social engineering. The attacker persuades the victim to approve a two-factor request by hitting approve uh, in Duo or ask them to send the code that they receive uh, from their device. Um, that, that attack does require the attacker to have your phone number, like in this case, at least, because the attacker has to text them. So that, that there's still a bar there. Um, and some of the more recent attacks are even more sophisticated. Uh, do a web search for charming kitten two-factor attacks if you want the details. Um, charming kitten is uh, the nickname of a, a nation state threat actor. Uh, but basically it involves a phishing message that directs the victim to uh, visit a malicious website where the attacker grabs the victim's password and then the attacker logs into the real website. That causes, that login attempt causes a two-factor request to go back to the victim still because it's the victim's phone number that's, uh, or device that's registered with Duo. Uh, the victim approves the request because they're expecting it. They just thought they logged into a legitimate site. 
one way to thwart this type of attack is to look at the location <coughs> indicated in the Duo app. So I, I don't know if you can see, but it says Berlin, Germany. It's, uh, it's a gray color, so it's hard to see. Um, if that's not where you are, then it's probably fake, and you should tap the Deny button. One problem with this is you have to be in the app to see it. Um, I'm, I wear an Apple Watch. I like the Duo app on the Apple Watch because it's just so convenient, but it doesn't display any of that stuff. It just says approve or deny. So I'm missing out on that safeguard. So while two-factor isn't perfect and no safeguard is, it has been very effective here and we plan to use it for the foreseeable future. One of the things we struggle with in higher ed is the feudal nature of departments and schools and the lack of IT centralization. And to be fair, there are many advantages to that arrangement in higher ed, and that's why it persists. But it can be a challenge for safeguarding IT resources. So a few years ago, we started a program called Cyber Risk Mitigation, and it's essentially a departmental self-assessment. IT staff and departments create inventories of their systems. Uh, they identify the data types that are stored on those systems and describe the safeguards around those, and they submit that documentation to a peer review team. Um, that peer review team looks at everything. Once they've reached consensus that the safeguards are appropriate, uh, the dean and the CIO sign off on the, the department's uh, submission. This is similar to the financial sub-certification process that uh, departments undergo, which is designed to uh, avoid financial issues and other kinds of malfeasance. Uh, cyber risk mitigation runs every two years, and each time through, we try to add something new to it. Uh, and this time, we added change management. So uh, we're trying to make sure that all units are doing some sort of change management. Some are going to be more robust than others, uh, but that's, we're, we're just trying to get people talking about that. And another uh, thing about the, the, the distributed IT, uh, um, also uh, post, it, it also poses challenges when a threat arises. So not just safeguarding what you have, protecting it, but response. Um, we have to rely on IT staff in 150 different departments, each of which has different procedures and ways of working, um, and, but we need them to take action. Uh, to improve this situation, we developed an extended staff program which uh, makes security people in the departments or IT people if they don't have somebody dedicated to security, uh, essentially part of our central security office. So when a threat arises, uh, we can direct those people to take action. Uh, so that improves our swiftness. Uh, what's more, they have access to all of the tools and resources that we have in the security office because we treat them as part of our team. So they come to our meetings, they hang out in our chat rooms, um, and we can also get direct feedback from them on any initiatives that we're trying to put forth uh, so that we make sure that what we're doing is reasonable. So I talked about some actions that IU is taking to address uh, current threats. Um, and a lot of these can be extended to other organizations too. So um, I've mentioned how the financial industry is sharing threat data and protection and response techniques um, shared security operation centers, that's not unique to us. Th those, are, those exist and they're going to be cropping up more and more everywhere um, as, uh, as they evolve. And of course, two-factor is becoming uh, pretty commonplace for internet services. You can turn on two-factor uh, for your Amazon account, for Gmail, for just about everything. Uh, but what are some of the less talked about improvements um, we can make in our field. It's easy just to Google and, and find out, you know, what, where is security going? But what are some things that I don't think are getting enough airplay? Um, well, let's start with how vulnerabilities come to be. A lot of work has been done 
developing systems and languages that make it easier to compute and code securely. Uh, some classes of vulnerability have even been eradicated uh, thanks to this research and these developments, but many still persist. Uh, one common culprit I've noticed is cleverness, which I think we need to work on reducing. Um, technologists love to be clever. I like to be clever too. That's why I like technology, right? But cleverness is actually the genesis of a lot of security vulnerabilities. For example, programmers might go to great lengths <laughs> to make their code appear more concise or elegant or sophisticated, showing off for their colleagues, basically to make themselves look smart, right? System architects might do the same thing when they're uh, configuring systems, making something overly elaborate, or fancy, and so doing, they introduce vulnerabilities. Or uh, more frequently, they introduce situations that cause vulnerabilities down the road because somebody comes in and they don't understand what they're looking at fully. Sometimes the person that comes in later is actually the same person that implemented it. Like I, I don't, you know, I'm a programmer going in and looking at my old old code and don't even understand it. Right? Code configurations, architectures should be as clear as possible to an outsider, and as simple as possible, but no simpler, right? Remember when I mentioned that human mistakes are an ever-increasing source of incidents? Uh, and some work has been done in the area of putting more resources into the usability of systems with an eye toward security, but in my opinion, much more is needed. I love these diagrams from the IDEA project, IDEA. Uh, you can find them at idea, ideainstructions.com. Uh, they have them for a number of different protocols. But the reason I bring it up is to illustrate uh, this usability problem that pervades information security. At IU, we love SMI uh, for digital signatures and encryption of email, especially at the executive level. Um, we sign email, we check signatures on mail we receive. But look how complicated this protocol is. And uh, anybody who has used it and used SMIME knows how cumbersome it can be, especially when something goes wrong. And really, most mail programs don't do much to make it easier. The protocol has to be complicated underneath. It, it's the way it works. But UI designers need to do more to make things like SMIME appear as simple as possible and no simpler to the user. Central takeaway is we need to keep making it easier for users to do the right thing. And in some cases, we're even doing the opposite, I would argue. So go back to my uh, statement about the, uh, the slide with the increasing threats. Credential reuse is on the rise, but do we make it easier for people to use different passwords on different sites? Mm, I mean, there are some browsers that do this. Uh, Safari automatically generates a new password, on, a unique password for every new site that you uh, register for, uh, and there may be other, I mean, there are other browsers do similar things. Um, but outside of that, most people are going to find it easier to just use the same password over and over again on the sites. And I know the people in my life that aren't technologists do this constantly. So when one of their services gets breached, then they're all exposed, right? We also talk about human mistakes. We think we're making things easier on users by doing things like implementing autocomplete for email recipients. Yeah, that's very convenient, but it has led, it leads to a lot of incidents. People thinking that they, you know, they just, they see the name come up, they hit tab, not noticing that they're sending sensitive data to somebody in another organization. And, you know, that, that's convenient, but the, the, the chances of a mistake are increased so much that things like that really need to be looked at harder. All right, so I'm done criticizing IT practitioners outside my field, and now I'll turn my sights on CISOs and security practitioners. We ourselves need to stop being so risk averse. And I don't mean on behalf of the organization, that's our job. I mean ourselves on our own computers. I think this is a mental leap for us because we're paranoid types in this field, um, but the problem is if we have all kinds of over-the-top safeguards on our own computers and with our own behavior, we're not 
we're not really doing what other people, what is reasonable for other people. So we're sort of putting ourselves in this little bubble and not experiencing technology the way the people we're supposed to be protecting are. I think that we should be, I think a CISO should use the same tools and practices as other leaders in the organization. Security staff should use the same tools and practices as other staff in the organization. How else are they going to really understand what the threats are? I know a lot of security people that shy away from new services, uh, especially cloud services, for example, perfect example. Um, these are services that everybody else in the organization is, is using. Um, if you're a security person, you don't like, if you find Google Docs distasteful, well, I got news for you. Everybody else is using it. If you're not using it, then you have no idea what threats everybody in your organization is facing. We're like bodyguards. We're, we should be right there with whomever we're protecting, maybe even out in front of them. Last but most important, we need to improve diversity in our field. You know how much of a monoculture information technology is? Well, information security is even worse. It's well understood that um, diversity, a diverse team is more productive, happier, uh, stronger, more resilient. Uh, but even CISOs who are actively trying to build diverse teams are having trouble getting women and minorities to even apply. How do we solve this? First, we need to listen to our existing staff. It might not occur to me, for example, that change is needed or what change is needed. I might be biased or ignorant. Our team culture or the language we use uh, in job postings, for example, could be turning potential recruits away uh, without us realizing it or, or understanding why. So we have to listen and be receptive to other ideas. Second, we need to take a hard look at the culture of our teams and uh, identify ways to make organizational change. So one of the ways to do this is to teach our existing staff how to be better allies for those on our teams with less of a voice. There's a good book on the subject by uh, Karen Catlin, I think is the right pronunciation. Um, it's called Better Allies, actually. Um, I recommend it. Third, when when we're recruiting, when we have open positions, we need to go to conferences, talk to people, go to presentations, uh, identify potential recruits, walk up to them and encourage them to apply, rather than just putting a job posting out there and waiting for people to, to come. Because this is going to offset the problem that all organizations have, which is their job descriptions are usually written in a way that turn away potential candidates. There's going to be, it, it's almost impossible to write a job description that everybody qualified is going to see and respond to and think, I'm right for that job. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to fix those, but you can only fix them so much and the way to, to, to balance that is to actually just go up to people and say, hey, I liked your talk. Do you want a job? I think we're heading in the right direction here, but we still have a long way to go and it's going to take everybody's participation to get there. All right, so those are just a few of the ways I think we need to improve in our field. Um, I've also covered several of the initiatives we're undertaking at IU right now, um, all aimed at reducing the time between first awareness of a threat and mitigation of that threat, and all supporting the vision and mission of Indiana University. Hopefully I've given you some idea of the perspective of a higher ed CISO, as well as some insight into our operations. Uh, this concludes my prepared remarks, but if you have any questions, I would be happy to dodge them. Anurag? It's cool you can see other CIOs and CIOs so I think it's all those kinds of same ideas like big panels. Um, some, I, I mean, some of, Andrew, can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But for remote do, folks? Do I, do I see other CISOs subscribing to some of the ideas that, so are you asking about the practices that we're putting in place at IU or the things that I think we 
need to do in our field. The thing you this, this, that one is a, um, now I want to be clear, I'm talking about ourselves individually. I'm not saying that CISOs in general are telling their organizations that they, um, that they need to reduce risk too much. Although in some cases I do think that's the case. But what I'm really talking about is as individuals. No, I don't hear a lot of people talking about this, and that's why I brought it up. Um, I, I know of some people that, that talk about this, but, but mostly when, when I go to my meetings with other security people, um, I, I notice that they are going to great lengths to, um, to avoid certain types of activity that is quite reasonable activity to be taking part in. I, there's a little bit of a caution here, which is, you know, I mean, the CISO is a juicy target, right? So you, you got to be mindful of that. But at the same time, the CIO is a juicy target. Should I be, you know, more careful than, the, than, the, than I would ask the CIO to be? Mm, I don't think so. Um, other things, um, I think the, the diversity thing is something that is being talked about a lot. Um, I, I don't think, none of us is very satisfied with the pace that it's going at, but we've got a big, we're digging out of a big hole. And there are pipeline issues and uh, there's just a lot, it's just a big problem. Um, I don't think there are enough people thinking about it top of mind. Uh, I, I think if you Google the, you know, the top 10 security issues, you're not going to see the diversity of the security team on there. And um, what else did I say? The usability thing, um, that's, that's pretty universally agreed upon, that it's too hard to do things right in technology. So yeah, that's pretty, that's not controversial. The cleverness thing is um, not controversial among security folks, but I'm sure programmers hate me for this slide. I mean, I, I used to be a programmer and I like to be clever in my code. I like to write clever code. And now I realize that that's, that's, not, that's not the way to A, be the most productive you can as a developer and do things in a way that's secure and repeatable and understandable by others. Right. Can you get a sense for how effective you were able to put yourself into the CIO's shoes? <laughs> I know for my case, if I if I go and use uh, a piece of software that my microbiologist girlfriend is using, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking about okay. I think you said, how do you put yourself in the CIO's shoes or the, the user's shoes? Um, well, I, and, and you gave the example of using a microbiologist software that yeah, so somebody okay. uses and you're wondering about. That's exactly the point, though, right? So observe people, observe what people are doing and, and try what they're doing and have that thought because that person is exposed. Like if, if you're worried about that, it's not doing input validation in, in this software that, that you try, then that, that's great. Like <laughs> we, we, we need to be worrying about those things because the people that are doing the research, if it's microbiology, it might even be PHI, right? So that's a great thing to immerse yourself in. I, you know, we're like, we can handle it. The security people can, like, we can handle being exposed to those risks. We know how to respond if something bad happens. We know what to look for better than other people. So we really should be immersing ourselves in those situations, in my opinion. Kevin? Yeah, I really found interesting the comment you made about being paranoid. I, I really kind of latched on to that. So 
Give me your thoughts about it. Is resistance futile then? Is the fact that we really just should resist all this? I can Google. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, Zubat, she, she made the point about uh, we really should be a little bit more uh, questioning and a little bit more uh, skeptical uh, about what's going on, especially like Google. And because she makes a long, long argument about Google and what Google is doing, especially if she talks about the uh, data exhaust and all the stuff she, that we're there getting for free and uh, monetizing. So I, I just should we just like in you know, the other term right here? If you're not on Facebook, you don't exist. I mean, is that where we're at now? Is this so, so the question is, if we should be less paranoid as security people, is is the logical extension of that just to to give up and not worry? Exactly. Yeah, I just accept all risk and that. No, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. So it's a little more nuanced than that, I think. What I'm saying is we shouldn't ourselves be insulating ourselves from the people that we're trying to protect and what they do. So you mentioned uh, Google. And if, if, so if, if I'm somebody who I, I like, you know, I don't like to use cloud services because I'm a security person, and so I'm not using Google Docs, I have no idea what the pitfalls of Google Docs are. I, I, I might not know that when you go into Google Docs, and you share a doc, document with somebody by creating a link, when you create that link, it automatically opens the sharing preferences to anybody with the link, anybody with the link. And you mentioned that. I, I think, too, with Facebook, how some researchers are using Facebook for questionnaires. Like, well, yeah. that, that can well the unintended consequences right. that it might lead to. So researchers using Facebook for, for <laughs> questionnaires, well, because that's where the people are. Yeah. Right? So that's, I'm talking about more the unintended consequences. The unintended consequences. And, and should yeah. they accept it? Should there be more skepticism and more vigilance about what's really going on here, guys? What's, what kind of terms and conditions do we have? And what, what are we really going to do with this information? Should there be more skepticism about Facebook? And I say yes, but we don't get that skepticism if we as security people are avoiding the very technologies that people are flocking to, right? The Google Docs link thing, I would never know about if I never used Google Docs. So I couldn't tell people about it and warn them. Or I couldn't go into our IU Google tenant and see if we can change that default setting to something more protective. So no, the answer is no. I don't think we should just give up and uh, stop worrying and learn to love the bomb. I'm seeing questions come in from the uh, um, chat from uh, Buddy and IUPUI. Are, are are we able to hear you if you ask them? Yes. Do we have any questions here? I think they're afraid to ask. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have questions from Buddy? I don't know if you can hear us with our mic. Uh, there's there's been some hardware issues on our end. Hardware issues in Luddy? Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead with questions here, and I'll see if I can get someone to read the, the chat. Okay. Uh, right. I would like to present a short uh, case mechanism, and I would like to see how you would handle it if you were the security officer at the presentation. So as a user of city, we are developing some research software for some government community. And the students can just Java code for them to let them comply. But under their rules, they cannot have Java compiled. Or they will send them a jar file, except for the email system there, private just time to be delivered as one private delivery in the file something in Java file. The most private delivery in the file which has been top of the system. Okay. Transfer it to Google Drive or just give them an account on our computer and use them to SFTP. So, so eventually we develop to something. One to kind of a jar file to text by using it to do that. And I spoke to people to use it all the time. That is coming from the end of my plan in my plan in the contract I said. And he's in my market at the contract file. I don't think it really needs to be dismissed, but something to transfer it to a computer and the government organization. Uh, so, uh, if you were a security officer, I don't think 
Okay, so let me see if I got all that. So we are working with a government agency and we need to send them code yeah, jar file. in jar file, but they prohibit sending code as attachments in email. In general, a good policy. Okay. I, I I would support that policy itself, but the way the workaround in this case is to take the jar file, convert it to plain text and do some other machinations to get it over there and it, it takes a lot of steps to basically to get the code important. Right, right. No, I mean, I think I would look for something a little less cumbersome for the user in that case. Because when you make things that cumbersome, then like it's like building the six foot solid wall, right? You'll get people trying to circumvent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, is there something more subtle or more, um, you know, just as effective, but more usable? Is there a way to have trusted senders? Is, I mean, could could we encrypt or digitally sign an email? Something like that. Uh, I think there are better ways to do this te technologically without second guessing who's involved, because who knows what other constraints are there. Yeah. I, I sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, yeah. It's like a black box. Yeah, it's hard to know. It's hard to know what what constraints they have. But yeah, yeah. I mean, in general, it, it goes back to the usability principle too, right? I think that um, some effort should be put in to make these things uh, easy. Like I said, easy for the user to do the right thing. So you, I'll ask another question about balance there. Um, mm -hmm. So you started off talking about the balance, and is that, in your experience, mostly a subjective sort of assessment of the balance, or do you So is the is the balance a um, is the balance a subjective thing, like where to strike the balance, or are, are we using any kind of quantitative uh, uh, analysis to? No, it's subjective. Um, and it's it's based on talking to people, the people that actually have to use the systems, and being a user of those systems yourself. Now, as far as I know, there's no there's no quantitative uh, work being done here. I could be wrong, but I haven't seen any. Yeah, um, regarding the Omnisoft, uh, I'm kind of curious with everything moving towards cloud and potentially all the big platforms essentially having their own stock that they use, you know, with Amazon, Microsoft, whatever. Um, how does that kind of fit into on premise? So how does the notion that everything is going to the cloud and the big cloud providers have their own socks, how does that affect the idea of the Omni sock? Um, I think I would answer that by saying for now at least the socks that the big cloud providers have don't really do all that we need as far as uh, identifying threats um, that, that are impacting our services in the cloud. So they, they know how to look for things that are, um, that are on the network. A lot of these things are encrypted now. Um, we're more reliant on using application logs for detecting uh, intrusion attempts, and that's probably something the cloud vendor isn't going to have access to. In some cases, they will if, if, the, if it's software as a service, right? But, um, but if it's a service we're running in the cloud, that's something where we need to be sending those application logs into a SOC so that they can be looking at the application level for intrusion. So really, that was kind of what I'm getting at, how to mix the two. How to mix the two. They're going to have their own project on. Oh yeah, that's something. So, so how, how can we make, make the best use of both things like OmniSock or an on-prem sock and um, and cloud socks? Uh, yeah, I I would say that um, I I think that there are the 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 way you secure cloud services is a big mind shift for security people. 
So it's tempting to say things like, um, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this is wrong, and we, we have considered things like this. If we have traffic going to a cloud platform, should we hairpin that network traffic through our, through IU and then back to the cloud so we can do our intrusion detection systems can, you know, can, and our other automated systems can see that traffic and, um, and take action? Um, maybe, but that's not really the cloud way. You're supposed to let the cloud services, you know, do provide their own threat protection and, and make use of that. And I think that's somewhere where we really need to expand and explore more because I think there's a lot of power in that. Some of those services are still a little um, nascent. So, like for example, it's really hard to get real real time logs from a lot of these services, which is what we often need for rapid detection. Um, and you're really stuck with relying on them to tell you, "Hey, you've got a problem." Um, and maybe that's not always as robust as we might want. So, yeah, good point. Andrew, can I just you jump in there with a question? Please. Thank you. Um, I, I am coming more from a communications background, and um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your communication strategy in a response um, to a cyber attack or, um, you know, any sense of responsibility to communicate to those um, users who where their information has been breached. So, so the question is, how um, What's our communication strategy when during an incident? Um, that we, we ha so we have um, an incident response team at IU that has a lot of experience with that, um, and uh, I, I would say our approach is very controlled. Um, we we don't want um, we we don't want our messaging to get out of hand during something like that. Um, I've noticed that when there is an incident and it's, it gets to be a certain size, then things can get picked up in the media, which is not a problem for me, except that a lot of times things can get misconstrued or misreported. So keeping control of that messaging is really, really important. Um, also, there is a, we have a duty to protect the identity of the victims. Um, so we treat that very seriously. Um, it's not appropriate for uh, people who don't need to know about an incident to be aware of who the victims are in an incident. Um, that can put them at, at further risk from uh, other attacks or other issues. So. Um, we try to keep as tight a control on that as we can. Thank you. So you, spoke, you spoke a little bit about um, your efforts to um, provide empowerment and alignment and enablement to the distributed IT shops at IU. I know that's somewhat of a new effort. Mm -hmm. But I also know that you also spoke about change management as part of cyber risk mitigation Maybe IT28, not sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And the reality is, I think that's a really important piece because the central IT or UITS can only do so much. And making sure that the IT professionals within the schools, unit shops, have what they need and are able to interpret what they see and have that dialogue is incredible. So I'd love you to tell us a little bit more about that effort. Sure. Okay. So the, the question is, can I say more about our uh, cyber risk mitigation effort and um, what we're doing to encourage practices in departments like change management, which we're focusing on this time around? Um, change management in particular, um, I agree, is like that's something that even though we have a centralized IT change management process, it can only do so much, like you said. Um, and it's really something that has to happen at every level. Um, and change management is, is of particular importance because 
this is another, I, I mentioned one area where vulnerabilities creep in is cleverness, but another one is, is just lack of, of change control. And, and so making changes without other people knowing about it, um, not documenting the changes. Change management allows you to go back and see what's happened. So we have an issue. Um, we don't know what's causing the issue. Well, let's, we have a change log. Let's go back and look through our past change management requests and, and, um, and that can help, help us figure that out. Um, the, the, the cyber risk mitigation process is, is really designed to be a self-assessment. So, um, and that's really the only way it can scale at a place that's large. And so I like to think of it as a, a way to, for units to take the time to, to reflect and analyze their programs and just sort of, you know, hey, have you thought about change management? Like, is this something you do at all? Um, I also like to think that we're, we give IT pros in the units an excuse I'm, all, I'm always happy to take the blame for anything. So, like, if you if, if you're an IT pro in a department, and you know you don't need me to tell you you need change management, right? You already know that you need it. But if you don't have it, you can go to your faculty, you can go to your department head or dean, and say, hey, it's not just me saying this. The security office says we need this too. I'm just doing I'm just following the rules. I'm just doing what we've been told to do. I, many IT pros have told me. That's what they need more than just about anything. It's just the, a, a way to show that they're not just off on some mission um, in their departments. They're, they're trying to adhere to the, the best practices that they, that they should be in the department. And so that, I, I think that can, um, can really motivate some of, some of those activities that, that maybe had not been going on the way they should have. And, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying the IT pros and departments don't know that. They do know that. They just need the space to do it. And I'm hoping that this helps provide that. Thank you. Does that answer? Okay. Buddy, did you get your audio working? We did. Did you have a, a question? Sorry, we haven't been able to, to read the chat. No, that's fine. Uh, we do have a question. So you were talking about um, in the risk mitigation, kind of talking with deans, directors, those kinds of things as IT pros uh, within departments. Um, what sort of metrics um, is the uh, security department using and not the phishing results kind of to determine what Indiana University's user habits and or mistakes, because mistakes was a large percentage early in the presentation. Um, to help us to kind of show the importance of that if we are, are to try and sell that to our directors and whatnot. Um, I, I think you're asking, can we provide more of those metrics so that you can use that as motivation or to sell your deans and department heads on implementing safeguards? Did I get that right? Yeah, I think I kind of, I took it as, as, as an add-on to the last question. I think more importantly what we're asking is what metrics are being used outside of the phishing results to kind of determine some of the common mistakes and or user habits uh, so we can help to train our users within our departments. Right, right. Um, a lot of our metrics are based on incidents. So um, our incident response team uh, keeps uh, very close track on incidents that come in and uh, does ca some categorization and some other analysis on those. And so we end up with a lot of metrics there. Um, we also develop metrics based on intrusion attempts that we might see um, on the network or it from application logs, for example. Um, and then there it's not all metrics based. I mean, we, we also use um, uh, data and um, accounts, stories, and things that we get from uh, our colleagues in the Big Ten or the REN-ISAC. 
um, things like, well, we're seeing an uptick of this particular threat, and we may not be seeing it here at IU, but if we analyze the situation, we might see that, well, we very well could be seeing that. Uh, and with it being seen at other institutions, then we better make sure that, that we're protected from that. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. I, I think it's just a matter of, you know, in order for our users to interact with the systems and make sure that they're usable, they're not doing workarounds or, or you know, throwing a, 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 you know, box of papers in the car like you mentioned earlier. Um, right. Are there some specific examples that we could give them based on uh, the experience to help get buy-in out of them? Uh, yeah, there might be. Um, I'd have to... I have to think on it some more, um, and I might be able to share some specific things with you if you contact me directly. Absolutely, thank you. Sure thing. Well, thank you for all the questions, folks, and thank you, Andrew, for your presentation and answer. Uh, so first, if you didn't sign in, please do take a moment to do so. Otherwise, IU Procurement gets concerned about me eating all these pizzas. <laughs> and then I hope we'll see everyone back on October 10th. We have some good questions today about privacy. And October 10th, in collaboration with the, Ma with the Maurer School of Law, we're going to be hosting uh, Nicholas uh, Guggenberger from the Yale Law School, who's going to talk uh, very specifically about privacy on the internet. So with that, thank you for coming today and hope to see you back here on October 10th. Thank you very much.